Good afternoon. At this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Recording to the computer or set. Thank you. Cloud has started. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And Sergeant Biondo with your opening statement. Yes. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the subcommittee on landmarks, public sightings and dispositions. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to landusetestimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is landusetestimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Riley, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Kevin Riley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Science and Dispositions. I'm joined remotely today by Council Member Kuhl, Council Member Barron, Council Member Miller, Council Member Traeger, and Council Member Feliz. Today, we will begin by hearing an application submitted by the School Construction Authority for the siting of a new school in Manhattan Community District 12. Then we will vote on that application and items we heard at our meeting on June 2nd. After we vote, we will hold the, we will then hold public hearings on two accelerated UDAP projects planned in the council districts represented by council member Dharma Diaz and council member Ayala and Gibson. I now recognize council to explain today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am Jeffrey Campania, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you register to testify and are not yet signed into Zoom, please sign in now and remain signed in until after you have testified. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you are not planning to testify on today's items, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are rec recognized to testify. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have written testimony you would like the committee to consider in addition to or in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of the presentation given at today's meeting, please email landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda. Thank you, Jeff. I now open today's public hearing on pre-considered application number 202-15029 SCM submitted pursuant to section 1732 of the New York School Construction Authority Act. This application is for a proposed site selection of property located at 3761 10th Avenue in the borough of Manhattan for a new approximately 860 C primary and intermediate school. This school will replace a leased space north of the site currently occupied by PS18 and PSIS278. The site is in the district represented by Council Member Rodriguez. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel is Gail Mandaro, Michael Mirasola, Andrea Bender, and Michael Kona on behalf of the School Construction Authority. Council, please administer the affirmation. Applicants, please raise your hands and state your names. Well, we'll wait until the applicants are in the room. Uh, we'll wait with just a moment as the applicants are being moved from the waiting room. Okay. 
When all the applicants are here, could you please unmute the applicants? Applicants, please state, raise your right hands and state your names. Gail Mandaro, SCA. Michael Mirasola, SCA. Michael Kona, SCA. Do you have a fourth applicant with you? Andrea Bender will not be joining us due to a conflict in her schedule this afternoon. All right. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record. You may begin. Yael Mandaro, Senior Director and Senior Attorney of the New York City School Construction Authority Real Estate Services Department. Michael Mirasola, School Construction Authority, Director of External Affairs. Michael Kona, SCA, Senior Project Manager, Real Estate Department, SCA. You may begin your presentation. Good afternoon, Chairperson Riley and Council Members. My name is Gail Mendaro and I am the Senior Director and Senior Attorney for Real Estate Services in the New York City School Construction Authority's Real Estate Department. Also with me this afternoon is Michael Kona, Senior Project Manager for Real Estate Services at the SCA and Michael Marisola, Director of External Affairs for the SCA. The New York City School Construction Authority has undertaken the site selection process for a new approximately 860 seat primary and intermediate school facility located at 3761 10th Avenue on block 2198 lots one and five in the borough of Manhattan. The site consists of approximately 27,710 square feet of lot area, approximately 0.64 acres. The northern portion of the site, known as Lot 5, is improved with a two-story masonry building. The southern portion of the site, known as Lot 1, is primarily a paved, uh, paved surface containing temporary steel structures. Under the proposed project, the SCA plans to acquire the privately owned parcels to construct a new approximately 860-seat primary and intermediate school building replacing an existing leased space occupied by two Department of Education organizations known as PS18M and PSMS278M. The site is located within Manhattan Community District Number 10 and Community School District Number 6 in the Inwood neighborhood of Manhattan. The notice of filing for the site plan was published in the New York Post and the City Record on February 12, 2021, at which time Community Education Council Number 6 Manhattan Community Board Number 12 and City Planning Commission were also notified of the site plan. The CEC and the Community Board were asked to hold public hearings on the proposed site plan. Manhattan Community Board 12, uh, 10 held a public hearing on March 8, 2021, and Community Education Council 6 held a public hearing on February 24, 2021. Public comments were received and provided as part of our submittal. The SCA affirms the site plan pursuant to section 1731 of the New York Public Authorities Law. In accordance with section 1732 of the New York Public Authorities Law, the SCA submitted the proposed site plan to the mayor and city council by letter dated uh, June 12th, uh, June 11th, 2021. We look forward to your subcommittee's favorable consideration of the proposed site plan and are here and prepared to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. I don't have any questions, but I would like to allow my colleagues to ask any questions. Council, are there any council members with questions? Council members, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand button now. I see no council member questions for this item. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank, Thank you. you. We're good. Thank okay. you very much. Good going. 
Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on these items, the public hearing on pre-considered application number 202-15029 SCM is now closed. We will now vote to approve application number 202-15029 SCM, which we just heard. We will allow vote to approve LU803 and 804, the Best Eye Central and the North NIHOP cluster, UDAP and Article 11. These applications submitted by HPD requested approval of the designation of an urban development action area and urban development action area project for such area and the disposition of city owned property and the exemption from real property taxation pursuant to Article 11 of the private housing finance law. Both items are related to four vacant city owned properties located at 187 and 187 R Chauncey Street, 772 Myrtle Avenue, 890 Myrtle Avenue, and 119 125 Vernon Avenue in the Best Side neighborhood of Brooklyn, represented by Councilmember Carnegie. These actions will facilitate the construction of approximately 45 affordable housing home ownership cooperative units distributed across the four sites. The sale prices will be affordable for household with incomes between 80 to 130% of the area medium income. We will also vote to approve LU805, the 72-H transfer of block 3930, lot 50. This application was submitted by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency pursuant to section 72-H of the general municipal law for the transfer of a city owned property known as block 3930, lot 50 in the borough of Staten Island to the United States of America, acting by and through the National Park Service. The proposed transfer will require that the entire property be used as an enhanced swamp and public access path in further hands of the environmental mitigation required by the South Shore Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project being undertaken by the federal government. The property is located in the district represented by Councilmember Mateo. We will also vote to approve five applications to facilitate the Merrill's Open Door Project in Chair Salamanca's district. These applications submitted by the Department of Housing and Preservation and the development which will facilitate the construction of 12 new residential buildings in the Bronx Community District 1, 2, and 3 that between will contain approximately 70 affordable cooperative home ownership units. When presented to the committee at our last meeting, Units were planned to be affordable to the household earning incomes between 80 to 130% of AMI. Since our last meeting, the proposal has been modified to be affordable to households earning between 63 and 83% of AMI. The project will be developed by MHANY and under HPD's Open Door Affordable Home Ownership Program. The properties included in the projects are vacant and will be demolished for new construction. LU801 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for designation of an urban development action area, approval of an urban development action area project, and disposition of a city-owned property located at 667 Claudewell Avenue, 675 Eagle Avenue, 672 St. Anne's Avenue, 84 Tinton Avenue, and 842 Tinton Avenue in the Bronx Community District 1. This action will facilitate the construction of approximately four buildings with approximately 28 cooperative units. LU 800 is an application for amendment to the Mount Haven Urban Renewal Pro Plan to exempt two sites in Community District 1, 675 Eagle Avenue and 672 St. Anne's Avenue from the floor area ratio 
open space ratio and parking requirement of the urban, excuse me, renewal plan. LU-799 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law requesting waiver of the area designation requirement of Section 693 of the General Municipal Law, waiver of the requirement of Charter sec Sections 197-C and 197-D, approval of the project as an urban development action area project for properties located at 1048 Fail Street in the Bronx Council District 2. This action will facilitate the construction of one new building with approximately four affordable cooperative units. LU802 is an application for the designation an urban development action area, approval of an urban development action area project for such area and approval of the disposition of the city owned property located at 881 Brook Avenue, 901 Eagle Avenue, 959 Home Street, 1298 Holt Avenue, and 1013 Home Street in Bronx Community District 3. This action will facilitate the construction of approximately five buildings containing approximately 32 cooperative units. LU-798 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 11 of the private housing finance law requesting approval of an exemption from the real property taxation for all the properties in the project area. I spoke to Council Member Salamanca and he is supportive of all three of these projects. With the support of the council member representing the affected districts, we will now vote to approve pre-considered application number 202-15029 SCM LU-798, 799, 800, 801, 802, 803, 804, and 805. Council, please call the roll. Riley. Yes. Ku. Barron. Before we I continue with the vote. I vote aye. I was muted. I vote aye. Councilmember Traeger. Aye. Councilmember Ku. Aye. Aye. Councilmember Miller. Aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, with zero in the negative, and with zero abstentions, all items are approved and recommended to the full land use committee. Thank you, Council. We now move on to our next public hearing for pre considered application number 202 15027 HAK and TBK 1002 Riseboro UDAP and Article 11. As the project name suggests, this application was submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law requesting approval of an urban development action area project. Waiver of the area designation requirements and the requirements of Section 197-C and 197-D of the New York City Charter and approval of a real property tax exemption for property located at 135 Menahan Street, Block 3306, Lot 53 in the Brooklyn Council District represented by Council Member Dharma Diaz. This action will facilitate the rehabilitation of a vacant six unit building for rental to families with annual households incomes up to 120% of AMI with rent set at 60% of AMI. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel is Hollis Savage and Rosa Kelly for HPD and Kelly Biscuso and Randall Torre for Riseboro. And it says to start the course, click on the training. Just wait a second for the applicants to be admitted. And please unmute the applicants.
Council, please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Rosa Kelly. Randall Turay, Riseboro. Kelly Viscuso, Riseboro. Hollis Savage, HPD. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yes, I do. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Rosa Kelly, Director of Planning, Land Use and Development at HPD. HPD is before the council today seeking an accelerated urban development action area designation, disposition and project approval, as well as an Article 11 tax exemption. The disposition area containing one vacant building is located at 135 Menahan Street in Councilmember Diaz's district and will be financed under HPD's multifamily preservation loan program. The property was acquired by the City of New York in July of 1986 via an, via an in rem foreclosure. HPD has designated Riseboro Community Partnership to purchase and redevelop the disposition area. 135 Menahan will be clustered and financed with six additional buildings designated to the sponsor in round 10 of the third party transfer program. And that larger project will be called TBK 1002 Riseboro. This larger project consists of seven buildings located in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn. I will now turn it over to Riseboro to present more on the 135 Menahan project in detail. Thank you, Rosa. Um, my name is Kelly Viscuso. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Riseboro and Randall. Oh, and my name is Randall Trey, Community Engagement Manager for Riseboro Community Partnership. And we have a presentation that we would like to pull up. I don't know if we should pull it up on our end or, oh, perfect. All right, great. So yeah, you can go to the next slide. So Randall and I just introduced ourselves, but we're going to quickly go through the proposed land use actions for this site, give a quick overview on the building itself, um, and then zo um, zoom out a little bit to go over the overall project the timeline for the project and a little bit of information about Riseboro before opening up to questions. To Next slide, please. Is there anything I can do to improve my skill set in the meantime? So the building is located at 135 Manahan Street on the corner of Central Avenue in Manahan in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, and we are before the council requesting an Article 11 tax exemption as well as the disposition of this site um, to be included within the larger project that was mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So as you can see, the yellow highlighted area in the screen is the building itself. It is currently a six unit walk-up building. Um, the, the building is vacant. Um, it was acquired by the city in 1986, as previously mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, we will be reconfiguring it as as was mentioned, um, the particular financing program we are looking to do with our partners at HPD would be um, to put in it into a low income housing tax credit application that would go in later this summer. And as part of that application, all the units would be affordable to um, tenants earning at or below 60% of the median income. And the as part of that application, Riseboro will enter into a 40 year regulatory agreement um, for the site. Um, we are proposing to configure the building into five rental units. So a studio, two one bedrooms, a two bedroom and a three bedroom um, to allow for a little larger unit sizes for families living in the area. And the chart on the right um, just gives a sense of where the 60% AMI income levels are currently at for households of different sizes within New York City. Next slide, please. Um, so as mentioned, the building is currently configured as a three-story building with railroad apartments that are currently six two-bedrooms each. It will be um, a, a gut rehabilitation. Um, We're going to be doing this under passive house design principles, which are just a, a very energy efficient type of building that um, our nonprofit group does with all of our new projects 
going forward, both our new construction and our rehabilitation projects like this one, it will be compliant with enterprise green communities, as well as NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy and Research Association. Um, it will you know, have a low carbon footprint, be ready for solar panels, and we'll use um, electric stoves and sort of air source heat pumps to um, provide, you know, really comfortable living and fresh air to all the tenants in these units. So sort of at a very high level, we um, will be rehabilitating, rehabilitating this project to um, a very high level of energy efficiency. Next slide, please. Um, so we're in front of you today um, seeking the UDAP approval. Um, later this summer, we will be submitting an application into HPD for 9% low income housing tax credits um, to include this building with uh, six other buildings that will form a cluster of 62 units um, of affordable rental housing in Bushwick. Um, so that application will go in. We're, if awarded, that would happen later in the fall. And we would then work to move towards a construction closing in the spring of 2022 with completion approximately three years later in the spring of 2025 for all seven buildings. Um, and most of that being um, because some of the other buildings in the cluster are occupied. And so there will be um, two phases to make sure to accommodate all the existing tenants in the building. So that's the, that's the overall timeline within which this building fits into the larger project that we are looking to advance. Next slide, please. Um, so just in terms of the overall project, it will be seven properties, 62 units total. Um, neighborhood Restore HDFC is the interim owner of the other six properties in the cluster. Um, we assumed management of the buildings in 2018 is part of the, the third party transfer program. As mentioned, this building is currently owned by HPD. Um, the current residents will be temporarily relocated given the need for gut, re gut rehabilitation of all of the units within this cluster. And then upon um, the culmination of this project, all of the residents will become rent stabilized. Next slide, please. This, just, this slide just provides a snapshot of where the seven buildings fall within Bushwick. So they're, they're located fairly close to each other. And again, this will, um, I think, be a, a really meaningful rehabilitation for the tenants living in these buildings, as well as for a building like Menahan to um, be able to take a vacant building and um, completely renovate it. Next slide, please. And um, actually, I'll turn it over to Randall to finish it off with just information about Riseboro and anything else he would like to add. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. So um, as many of you know, Riseboro has been in the Bushwood community since 1973, and we basically have a holistic uh, approach to um, our community development. And so we have um, what we call our divisions, Riseboro Seniors, Riseboro Housing, which this project is under, Riseboro Education, Riseboro Health, and um, Riseboro Empowerment. And so one of the things that, you know, we are always pride ourselves on is making sure that not only do we provide housing for um, our tenants, but we also provide other services for them as needed. So we have many of our tenants are involved in our educational slash youth program, um, our health program, our empowerment program, which helps them with um, social services or all sorts of um, different types of services they may need. And then when at certain levels, they may need senior services, we also be able to provide them with that. So this is, you know, the goal of Rise Barrel is to um, be not more than just a, um, a housing developer, but a uh, community um, asset. Uh, next slide, please. Kelly, you want to talk about the footprint? Sure. Um, and so as you can see, Riseboro's footprint has been historically in the neighborhood of uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn, and in Ridgewood, Queens. Um, so we're, we currently have about 137 buildings that we own and operate with about 4,500 tenants. Um, it, it comes out to roughly about, you know, 1,900 units owned and another 150 managed, um, as well as several ground floor commercial spaces um, in, um, 
in Bushwick. And um, in recent years, we've been expanding our footprint across the city to um, also include Manhattan, the Bronx, and Queens. So we're, our footprint is growing, but um, these buildings are still located sort of in, in the heart and soul of our, our service area and where we have the majority of both our buildings and our social services provided. Um, and I think that's, um, next slide, please. That is the end of our presentation and we'll open it up to any questions if now's the time for that. Thank you, thank you. Um, just two questions. Uh, you spoke about the senior and youth programs. I uh, just wanna kind of elaborate on that. What kind of senior and youth programs do you Absolutely. have? Absolutely, so we have um, a youth, uh, a youth um, we actually have a school that we are part of and we have a uh, youth center in uh, Bushwick, um, and um, we're involved with a um, uh, a local community sort of uh, uh, charter school in Bushwick, and then our senior centers. We have basically senior centers, also what we call older adult centers, and then also we have uh, seven two hundred two um, that we so we provide senior housing also, and then we are also now involved in uh, providing new senior housing out, outside the 202 pro, pro, uh, program, um, our first of which is in um, uh, the Woodlawn area of the Bronx. Um, we have an 80 uh, unit building that is coming online. Um, it's in, um, uh, like I said, it's in the Woodlawn area community board uh, 12. And we're also looking at developing a senior building in the um, Inwood section in Council Member Rodriguez's district. Um, so our senior services are complete. We both do housing and senior centers. Nice, nice. Um, and uh, you kind of answered my second question. I know you guys said your footprint is basically in Brooklyn, but you have branched out to across the city. Um, just for my personal uh, well-being, how many locations do you have in the Bronx? Right now we have one, the Woodlawn, um, Woodlawn. Um, senior, the Woodlawn Senior Center, but we're also in the process of, we're, we're looking at other locations. Kelly, I don't know if you want to address it or I think we're sort of. That's the only one that's sort of yeah. um, really, you know, in the ground and ready in the Bronx. And as you mentioned, we have the project in Inwood. Um, we are also. I believe um, mm -hmm. council members right next to your District, yeah, that, right? that's my community board. District. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's right next to your district. It's not in your district, but it's right next to your district. Yeah, it's in council member Dinowitz district. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, oh, uh, we actually this and this is unrelated. We'll we'll be reaching out to your office related to um, um, you know, um, making sure that your, that uh, members of your community get applications for Thank it. You. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, so much. that that is on our list, our to do list. <laughs> um, I see Councilmember Barron has a question, so I'm going to allow her to ask it. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee for uh, hosting this panel discussion and to the panelists for presenting their request to us. I have a question, not really directed so much at this project. Well, the specific question I have for this project is, can you please go back to the slide that talks about the number of units that will be in this project and the size of the units. I think it's the next one back. Yes, this right one, there. okay. So it's gonna be five units in this apartment, in this building rather? Correct. One, three, one, two, and two one bedroom units and one studio. So is the studio, uh, is there going to be a, a building, an apartment reserved for a caretaker? Or is that going to be in another location? Oh, you mean like a superintendent? Yes. Yeah, um, the, the superintendent's unit will not be located in this building. Um, I believe there will be a super's unit within one of the overall buildings in the 62 unit cluster. And sort of, as we mentioned earlier, this uh, Riceboro will be the property manager for this overall set of buildings. And so our superintendent will sort of um, you know, float between the different buildings, given, given their size and the scattered site nature of it. So we don't envision that one will actually be in this building, I don't believe. 
Okay. And the family size you have here from one through seven, is there a minimum family size for that three bedroom apartment? Yes. Um, I would, Randall, do you know off the top of your head? Um, I, I believe, you know, through, per the city's guidelines, um, that yeah, there has to be a minimum, you know. I believe it's, yeah, I believe that you it's a minimum of of three, depending on the okay. makeup of the family. So you may have right. one gen, one yeah. adult or a parent, and then a male and a female child, or you may have um, a two adults and okay. um, yeah, that so that sort of thing. So the configuration will, but I think the minimum is three um, individuals for a three bedroom. Okay. Um, so if it's a family of, let's say family of four that is applying for that three bedroom apartment, they would have to make, according to your chart, 71,580 to- that's the, that's the ceiling. That's the maximum. That's not, the, that's oh, okay. not what they have to make. No, there is oh, okay. a, they can make so, below that number. Right. It always, it's always interesting to me uh, when I don't see a range, indicated on a chart because people looking at that would simply see that as a very definitive number. So my suggestion would be that you indicate what the range is. I think it should uh, say somewhere less than 71,000. Yes, but I'm saying it, it should, I would suggest that you give the range the, the minimum as well as the cap. Because someone looking at this would say, oh, well, if I don't have 71,000, I'm not eligible. You, you understand my point? Absolutely. Yeah. That's okay. Good point. Uh, so I would recommend that so that people uh, will not be deterred from considering applying. And the other question or comment is regarding the other properties that you own. Were they all, were the other properties also third party transfer properties? Within Riseboro's portfolio? Yes, within your um, portfolio. There, there are third party transfers, um, but there are also, so it, Riceboro has done both new construction and rehabilitation work across um, its 40 plus year um, lifetime um, working in this area. So we, we do have experience doing um, these types of re rehabilitations through a third party transfer, as well as just overall, um, you know, taking over um, and, and, you know, rehabilitating and operating uh, buildings in the neighborhood. But we've, as Randall mentioned, we um, have developed uh, seven uh, two senior buildings through the HUD Section 202 program. Mm -hmm. And more recently, we've also done um, new construction buildings through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. So sort of over our history, as the financing programs have changed and evolved from, you know, the HUD's 202 program to more low-income housing tax credits, we've done different types of developments with it. But we do have, um, you know, a, a large number of the buildings in our portfolio are, um, you know, typical to um, to Bushwick and sort of, you know, the sort of walk-up um, mm -hmm. construction like these buildings. Let me. I think the. Let me just jump directly to the to answer what your question is. The bulk of those those buildings were early buildings that were when there was a, um, when Bushwick was less attractive and you had a lot of abandoned buildings, a lot yes. of those were rehabs. Right. So there were abandoned buildings that were rehabbed and that's where the early, the early part of the portfolio um, that you see came from is rehabilitating um, a lot of abandoned buildings or um, um, really poorly maintained buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the, my other comment is not directed to Rise Bearer Riseboro per se, but simply to the uh, TPT program. Um, and just for HPD to consider and to uh, reflect upon and perhaps get back to me. And my concern is that where there are in fact those buildings that have been a part of TPT, uh, there was a time where there was an opportunity for the residents of the building to in fact become owners once the building had been rehabbed. I understand that that is no longer the case when there are residents who are in a building and it goes to TPT, they then are under new management and they have to then uh, abide by the rules, regulations and stipulations that exist. So I asked this question of HPD some time ago and never got 
a response. I would like to request if the chair would allow uh, for a response to the question in writing, where does it state or why is it that there can no longer be ownership of the building return to those residents once the rehab has been completed? And this is not directed at Riseboro for any uh, particular reason or not to single you out. But when did that policy change? And where is it stated that it changed? That residents who previously would have an opportunity to become co-op owners of the building where they were living, that those residents would no longer have that opportunity. I would imagine that oftentimes the residents who are in these buildings and have these wonderful rehabs done and they're really quite uh, appropriate and very sturdy, why those residents, I would imagine that many of those residents have seen a significant increase in their rent. So that ties into a part of the reason that I'm asking that question. But thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming and presenting. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. And we could follow up with HPD to get your thank answer. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor, are there any more council members with questions? All right. I see no other council members with questions. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you, everyone. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on pre-considered application number 202-15027 HAK for the TBK 1002 Riceboro UDAP and Article 11 is now closed and the item is laid over. Our last item today is pre-considered application 202-15030 HAX. The TBX 1002 MPD UDAP and Article 11, as with the previous project, this application was submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law requesting approval of an urban development action area project. Waiver of this area designation requirements and the requirements of Section 197-C and 197 dash D of the New York City Charter and approval of a real property tax exemption for properties located at 970, 970 Anderson Block 2504 Lot 50 and 1105 Tinton Ave Block 2266, uh, 22,661 Lot 52 Borough of the Bronx. The properties are located in council districts represented by Council Member Gibson and Ayala. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel is Hollis Savage and Rosa Kelly for HPD once again, and Derek Lovett for MDV uh, Community Housing Corp. Council, please administer the affirmation. Applicants, please raise your hands and uh, state your names once again. Rosa Kelly, HPD. Hala Savage, HPD. Derek Lovett, MBD Community Housing Corp. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record. You may begin. Good afternoon again. Uh, my name is Rosa Kelly, uh, Director of Planning, Land Use, and Development at HPD. Um, HPD is, again, before the Council, seeking one accelerated urban development action area designation, disposition, and project approval, as well as an Article 11 tax exemption. This land use item consists of a disposition area containing two buildings, 
located at 970 Anderson Avenue and 1105 Tinton Avenue in Bronx Council Districts 8 and 16. The project will be rehabilitated under HPD's Multifamily Preservation Loan Program. HPD has designated MBD Community Housing Corp as the sponsor. When completed, the project will provide approximately 54 rental dwelling units and one commercial space. 970 Anderson Avenue and 1105 Tinton Avenue will be clustered and financed with two additional buildings designated to the sponsor in round 10 of the third party transfer program. And that larger project, project will be called TBX 1002 MBD. This larger project consists of a total of four buildings located in the Highbridge and Morrisania areas of the Bronx. And the project will include approximately 68 total residential units. So I'll now turn it over to MBD to present the project in more detail. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Once again, um, Councilmember Shirali and all the other council members and people present, thank you very much for having me. My name is Derek Lovett. I'm the president and CEO of MBD Community Housing Corp. I'd like to talk to you about our project. Uh, 970 Anderson Avenue and 1105 Tinton Avenue. We're requesting Article 11 for the HPD program, Much of Family Preservation Loan Program. The MBD was formed in uh, 1974 at a mission statement as Community Housing Corp. It seeks to improve the quality of life of our community through housing development, property management, economic development, and the delivery of human services. We currently own 41 buildings and over um, 1,200 units. We sponsored and constructed and renovated over 4,000 units. Okay, are the, are the slides up? Before I continue, if not, I will. I don't see them. Okay, thank you. We can go to the next slide. We can go. We can go two slides. Okay, this is a building that we will be having, which is 970 Anderson Avenue. It consists of eight three um, bedroom units on the top, and in the basement, it has a one bedroom. Uh, supers unit, also heard it referred to today as a caretaker's unit. Um, this will undergo a gut rehab. Uh, the tenants will be relocated at the developer's expense and relocated back. Um, next slide. Of the nine units, seven are occupied, two are vacant. This is located in the Councilman Ayala's district. Um, MBD received uh, management of this in 2018, and we're looking to combine it with a number of other buildings. Um, next, next slide. 1105 Tenton is another other buildings. It's a 45 unit, five story walk up. This will undergo a gut rehabilitation. It also has one commercial unit. This is a, I'm sorry, six story walk up with the 45 units. Um, this building is city owned. There's no exist, existing tax exemption or regulatory agreement. After upon transfer and MBD rehabs this, it will have a 40 year regulatory agreement. Uh, next slide, please. One more. Okay, the current scope is we're gonna go from top to bottom. New roof, new windows, new boiler, um, painting, we're gonna gut the whole thing, put in new new pipes, new electricity, um, new kitchens, new baths, new appliances, everything will be uh, energy efficient. Next slide. Um, we are providing a section of vouchers for HPD for other eligible households. We're aiming to 60% AMI, though through this program, it allows to want 20% AMI. We are underwriting this to 80% AMI. I did understand the comment of there should be a range. I will certainly have that and any future pre uh, presentations. Next slide. 
this will be incorporated into an overall larger property uh, um, development project, which will consist of four buildings, totaling 69 residential units and one commercial unit. All will be at 6% AMI. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. Um, I see Councilmember Barron has a question. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you uh, to the developer, the applicant for coming to make your presentation. I think it is unconscionable to say that New York City will be rehabbing a building that is six stories and not make provisions for an elevator. We're talking about ADA compliant uh, uh, subway stations, and that's a, a distance of perhaps one or two stories. How do we think that we can have a six story unit and not make provisions? We're making a new building anyway, new kitchens, new this, new bathroom, new, that, new pipe, and not put in an elevator. Six stories. I don't see how the city can consider this. Is there a way that this developer can become creative and think of how to put in an elevator in a six story building in New York City that he's gut rehabbing anyway? Uh, thank you, Council Member Barron. Um, yes, we are absolutely, we absolutely hear you. Um, and uh, MBD will be getting back to you with a formal response on the building design. But yeah, we, we absolutely hear you on the, the walk up. Great, thank you. And oh, another question. I didn't quite understand uh, the comment that was made about going from 60% to 80%. I didn't quite understand. The developers said that uh, they would be making some type of contribution. Could you explain that a little more detail to me? I didn't get it. I, I, I believe what I said was, while the program allows for 120% of AMI, we are underwriting it to 60% of AMI, to a lower income level, to make it um, more feasible to the folks that live in the area. Oh, okay. So perhaps I missed the 120. Perhaps I just heard mm -hmm. the 20 out of the 120. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Just Thank to you. echo Councilmember Barron, I, I think she brought up a very important point. Uh, there has to be a way that the city could figure that out because we do have uh, ADA accessibility um, going everywhere else. So we should be able to figure that out. Um, so just want to echo uh, her sentiments. Uh, council, is there any other uh, council members with any questions? Are there any other council members here with questions? If you uh, use the raise hand button now. There are no other council member questions. <laughs> There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you so much. Have a lovely week. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who wish to testify to who is to testify on this item, the public hearing on pre-considered application 202-15030-HAX, the TBX-1002, MDP, UDAP, and Article 11 is now closed and, and the item is laid over. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, sub subcommittee council, land use staff, and the sergeant at arms for, for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>